ফিলোসফি and cultural politics at the University of Wolverhampton, United Kingdom. Born and brought up and educated in the Indian Punjab, she did her doctorate at Oxford University as a Commonwealth scholar. She's an advocate of socially engaged philosophy and conducts transdisciplinary research in projects linking caste, class, race, and gender. Notably, she led the UK Equality and Human Rights Commission project cast in Britain, producing two key research reports. She's the author of The Negotiation of Personal Identity and editor of Reservations for Women and Special Issues of Journals, J-Cast and Religions. Her papers include Anti-Castism and Misplaced Nativism in Radical Philosophy 2015, Castism Amongst Punjabis in Britain in EPW 2017, made to think and forced to feel the power of counter ritual in B.R. Ambedkar, The Quest for Justice 2020, and philosophical foundations of anti-casteism in Proceedings of Aristotelian Society 2020, which is one of the reference points for this conference. Her journey as an anti-caste academic activist is recounted in an interview, Confronting Denials of Casteism, published in South Asia, multidisciplinary academic journal Samaj 2021. So over to you, Professor Dhanda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahitosh. Uh, first of all, I must congratulate you for being so prompt in starting all the sessions and ending them in time as well, uh, and managing the whole process of the conference in such an efficient and caring manner. So you, as well as uh, all the helpers who have made this possible, is a, a big word of thanks from all of us. So thank you so much for giving us this opportunity and bringing us all together. Uh, I've had the uh, pleasure of chairing a session earlier today and uh, with papers from uh, young scholars. Uh, today, I am uh, in the presence of three really important uh, and well-known uh, thinkers. Uh, so I am going to introduce them to you briefly and and then maybe set out a couple of questions uh, and then from there on uh, give them an opportunity to share with you what they think. So our panel is Reflections on Anti-Castism. Uh, our first speaker is uh, K. Satyana Rang. He is a professor of in the Department of Culture Studies at the English and Foreign Language University, Hyderabad, India. Uh, he co-edited two volumes of New Hamid writing, No Alphabet in Sight in 2011, and Steel Nibs Are Sprouting in 2013. He's also a co-editor of Dalit Studies 2016, uh, Dalit Text 2020, and most recently, Concealing Caste, Passing and Personhood in Dalit Literature, which is forthcoming. His research interests are in the fields of Dalit studies, literary history, and cultural theory. Uh, our other speaker, second speaker, and these are not necessarily in the order in which I will ask them to contribute, is Balmurli Natarajan. He is an anthropologist with long-term research on group formation, identity and inequality, culture, and development. He has written extensively on caste, caste and race, crude politics, domestic workers' unions, and most recently on toilets and human behavior. He is the author of the book, The Culturization of Caste in India, Identity and Inequality in a Multicultural Age, and co-editor of Against Stigma, Studies in Caste, Race, and Justice since Darban. 
He's a professor of anthropology at William Patterson University of New Jersey, USA, and he is very active in solidarity work. Our third speaker is Meena Kandasamy. She is an anti-caste activist, poet, novelist, translator, and actor, celebrated for her fearless expression and piercing critiques of casteism and misogyny. Her books of poems include Touch and Miss Militancy. Her first novel, The Gypsy Goddess, in 2014, was followed by When I Hit You, or a portrait of the writer as a young wife in 2017, Explicit Cadavers, 2019. She has translated from Tamil into English political writings of Periyar E. V. Ramasamy, Why Were Women Enslaved in 2007, and of Thol Thirumavalvan, Uproot Hindutva, The Fiery Voice of the Liberation Panthers in 2004. She has edited and translated poems by Tamil women poets in Desires Become Demons in 2018, and is the co-biographer of Ayan Kali, a Dalit leader of organic protests in 2008. Her latest work is a collection of essays, The Orders Were to Rape You, Tamil Tigresses in the Elam Struggle 2021. Nina holds a PhD in social linguistics. Her novels have been shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction, the International Dylan Thomas Prize, the Chalet Prize, and the Hindu Lit Prize. I welcome all three of you. Uh, and we shall begin uh, straight away um, to uh, set the scene. I will briefly set the scene for what we are going to discuss today. Uh, the way in which we will do it, uh, there will be two rounds of questions. I'll begin with the first round and a call on uh, my fellow panelists to contribute. Uh, and then uh, there'll be a second round of questions. And following that, we'll open for Q&A from the audience and other participants who are a part of this Google Meet. So um, casteism, at least the way I look at casteism, is, is a form of uh, inferiorization. And anti-casteism for me is, a, is an ideological critique. It's an ideological critique which is aimed at unmasking the unethical operations of caste. And in this critique, um, we need to undo the mystifications which govern our caste, caste governed lives. So, uh, so it's aimed at truth, really. Uh, and the goal is, uh, is final goal is maitri, friendship, um, which for me is a, is a praxis and it relies on developing ethical social solidarity. So the first step is a critical scrutiny of a received opinion. Uh, but of course, everyone makes sense of the world in their own way. And uh, this can often generate uh, what I call collective hypocrisies. So anti-casteism then faces a big challenge. Uh, it's not as if everyone who says that they are committed to anti-casteism is actually um, led by a genuine desire to uproot casteism uh, in a serious way. Sometimes people commit themselves or say that they are committed to anti-casteism only to deny that caste is pernicious at all. So that's, that's what I want to say for, for a beginning. There are many, many questions that arise about how we must look at our history, there are questions about how, uh, whether, what terms we must use. So in his opening address, Gajendran said that um, he has stopped using the term Dalit. Now, uh, on the surface, it's not so simple to uh, accommodate that kind of um, announcement uh, because there are still many anti caste activists who continue to use the term Dalit and who do think of themselves as uh, uh, fighting a struggle for um, caste e for equality uh, and against caste as Dalit. So uh, we, we, we shall discuss these questions as we go along. And I'm sure that between the three of you, uh, there will possibly also be differences of opinion. So I want to start by, in the first round, I'll ask Meena to, to 
tell me or tell us what does anti casteism mean to you and what kind of theoretical lens do you find most productive in articulating anti casteism um uh, thank you for yeah thank you to uh, professor danda and to uh, to mahitosh mandal for having me here and uh, it's uh, lovely to see um, the other panelists as well i think professor satyanarayan i'm possibly meeting after a decade or something um, i think somebody's mic is on uh, turned off uh, turned on can this uh, turn it off Oh yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so the thing is, um, uh, there are many ways of answering or you know talking about this. And your question actually set me thinking. Uh, one of the interesting ways, um, because I happen to do popular fiction and uh, I write in general not for the academy but more for consumption by you know like as poetry or as novels. Uh, I find that you know any theoretical framework that you take, you know, nece not necessarily. Um, Op, you know, oppressive framework that upholds things, but any whether you're talking about, you know, Bordeaux and class capital or any cultural capital, whatever you talk about, you're talking about violence, you're talking about Foucault, whatever it is, you can apply it to anti-caste work. This is a very honest uh, sharing, you know. Uh, I don't want to mystify and say, oh, this is the only way of looking at caste because I think the system has, you know, uh, been uh, so complicated that, you know, if everything can prove inspiring and everything has proved inspiring in terms of how I look at work. So in my own understanding or how I have been influenced in terms of writing, one of the core things has been feminism. Uh, as, as a framework to understand caste, because uh, you understand how this system uh, enslaves women, how it subjugates women, and a lot of anti-caste thinkers, uh, and it's not just because, you know, I happen to be a woman and I'm speaking about this issue, but a lot of anti-caste thinkers have put their finger on this and said, you know, the issue of con the control of women, the subjugation of women, the ill treatment of women, the necessarily the objectification of women, you know, you're no longer a being, you are constantly treated as a suspicious object. All of this contributes to the way caste is seen so liberatory emancipatory anti-caste work or theory or how what, whatever we choose to call it has to forefront or foreground or at least accept in itself the idea of you know uh, a feminist opposition to caste so this is i think one of the ways in which uh, I understand, uh, and uh, again and again, like even if we think, oh, is it because you know feminism is such a buzzword, and also feminism is a very problematic word for those in the first world because you know, I f constantly find my friends getting upset about it. So you know, they're into girl boss, they are into you know leaning in, they, uh, they, and the way it's appropriated uh, to you know like um, white men saving brown women kind of rhetoric. So I can understand there are problematic uh, aspects of feminism, but I would still say that you know femi uh, I. Constantly look at caste and anti caste work through a feminist uh, framework or a perspective. And the second thing that I would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, from my understanding or, you know, readings of Periyar. Uh, and the readings of uh, uh, other anti-caste thinkers from the Tamil landscape, such as, you know, even Thirumavalavan and others, uh, is to understand caste as a system of violence. It's a violent uh, and anti-caste work as, as work that opposes this kind of violence. And in fact, uh, I would counter violence by saying as a pro project of democratization. So uh, caste is uh, caste in itself says, OK, you cannot study. So and then there are punishments prescribed. But this violence is not always, you know, uh, at, at its most to gruesome, like what happens in Dharmapuri or what happens in all of these you know, places where violence breaks out. It's actual physical violence. It's the physical violence of burning huts. It's the physical violence of killing lovers. It is a physical violence of, you know, uh, killing people because, you know, they drive a bike or they have a mustache or because they have Ambedkar's ringtone or wear an Ambedkar shirt. And I think opposed to this violence, opposed to this violence is a project of, you know, uh, lay, laying claim, but also a project that says that, you know, th this has to stop. So uh, I believe that, you know, much of the, especially because casteism uh, shows itself or, you know, um, uh, asserts its power, uh, its dominance through uh, aspects of violence. I think understanding caste by uh, the idea of, you know, uh, either, uh, um, either I think like Ambedkar embracing a very nonviolent religion like Buddhism, or on the other hand, you know, talking about counter violence becomes very important to the anti caste project. And I want to re re go back here to the work of uh, uh, the Vidhala Chirutagal in Tamil Nadu in the um, early 90s when this slog sloganeering used to be 
அடங்க மறுப்போம் அத்தும் ஈறுவோம் திமிர் எழுவோம் திருப்பி அடிப்போம் Uh, we will uprise and then tirupi adipom we will hit back so the idea that your violence will be met with violence the fact that you know this the systemic violence will be met with counter violence was a kind of thing that you know it was, it was it was a militant articulation and this militant articulation came in the backdrop of many things you know tamil nadu as a his uh, rich uh, communist history tamil nadu also has uh, and a communist history that was very close to you know uh, the liquidation of the landlords to fighting back but it also has a very rich history uh, inspired especially in the 80s and 90s by the liberation tigers or the ltte so the idea of you know hitting back counter violence to claim democracy to claim equality uh, i think is entrenched in and within the anti caste movement so this is another perspective in which i would approach anti casteism that you know that um, and and in fact this kind of violence uh, this kind of even the idea that you know we will hit back even if the vidyalaya chirtegal did not always hit back uh, i think it does uh, it does create give a confidence it does create you know it shatters the image of you know uh, the perennial victim so i think this was very important uh, within uh, articulating you know the anti caste movement especially the liberation panthers uh, in tamil nadu and um, which is also why um, so these these are the two main ways i would look at that but i also just wanted to because you know this this set me thinking in in many ways i also think that uh, looking at anti caste work uh, ha- has to happen a lot through the realm of language as well language is in and of itself is not a uh, theoretical framework but understanding the hegemony between languages so when we look at let's say periyar periyar if you look at his lifetime work he is opposed to the hegemony of hindi related to sanskrit and how that is going to lead into you know a certain um, uh, you know power dynamics and he constantly was talking about tamil as a counter to it so what does it mean you know for in anti caste work to look at you know la- language uh, and the relationships between them and uh, when tirumavalavan for instance and the liberation panthers adopt tamil names uh and say that you know when somebody has only a tamil name uh, all of us become indivi- you know individual we don't we have secular tamil names these names don't re- uh, show our religion but then he also sh- says that this takes away caste because it's only the non brahmin caste and the brahmin caste who use sanskritized names so this is also one of those and then he also and tirumai is quite interesting in his work uh because uh, he goes beyond just talking about you know the retrieval of tamil but he also talks about the f- many tamils that exist the tamil of the cheri the tamil of the dalit people the tamil that is not corrupted the tamil that doesn't always get into dictionaries as opposed to a tamil that has got sanskritized and therefore more legitimacy so in this this uh, this uh, tamil renaissance project and what does it mean i also think this is very interesting because i, I happen to be reading something i'm writing on the tirukkural talking about how was the supremacy of the vedas became like such a oriental project when in fact the vedas themselves were not always available to the europeans you know the fact that some it was an apt, absent text and it had so much legitimacy so the fact that you know how do you, how do you you know if you talk about anti casteism to spell it in other words there's lots of you know there's of, of course a hierarchy there are the shudras oppressing the dalits and the shudras in turn are oppressed but the so at the height of the pyramid sits the brahmin and i think to to shatter brahmin privilege i think people like ambedkar periyar phule all of them start, launched an attack on you know sanskrit texts and i think this aspect of looking at um, anti caste work through the prism of you know language the superiority of language the divinity of some languages you know the divinity for instance of sanskrit all of this uh, and especially the modi government which has given about 22 times funding to sanskrit compared to all of the classical languages so i think we have to look at all of this i don't want to hog all the time but these are the three things in which i would approach this uh, the anti caste work and it's not about me but it's about the movements that i follow or i understand or i am inspired by and i would you know mention periyar and tirumalan because they come from tamil nadu and you know this is just a tamil feminist or <laughs> women's perspective thank you for this opportunity yeah thank you i i as just said that uh, it's it's very exciting for me to have lovely meeners that i know there's you there's meena kotwal and i i just so lucky to have my name meena when i find all of you people with the same name <laughs> so 
I want to now ask Satyendran to please uh, tell us what does anti-casteism mean to you? And what kind of theoretical lens do you think is most conducive to helping us understand what it should be? Yeah, <coughs> yeah thank you, Mina. And I thank us, uh, uh, my host for, uh, you know, uh, for this conference, uh, the number of a uh, range of themes. And also I'm very happy to see Mina, though I read regularly in the papers and more recently is in the news. So and to Murali and all other friends. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, make, I'm saying this uh, uh, a few words based on uh, my experience of uh, maybe less than a decade of working in an organization which is roughly translatable as a, a forum for caste and relation. So there is a, a kind of manifesto worked out thinking that we will destroy caste. And of course, we went to the field in about seven to 10 districts in Andhra Pradesh. So about a decade, so I was a general secretary to that forum and I worked. So based on those uh, experiences, uh, briefly, uh, I would like to bring some points to uh, your attention. So I looked at the concept note uh, that Ashutosh uh, prepared, uh, Mahitosh prepared, uh, which describes uh, anti-casteism as a deep-rooted prejudice and roughly translatable as uh, caste discrimination against uh, lower caste and Dalits. And, and of course, which is something that really uh, expands Ambedkar's agenda of in relation of caste. I think this is how he uh, presents it. Uh, but generally, by my own experience uh, uh, in the uh, Telugu uh, uh, society, I'm deeply uh, suspicious of uh, uh, this whole term uh, anti-casteism as a concept, because it's deeply, uh, deeply problematic unless it is carefully uh, defined and handled. And that's my uh, uh, first point. And because it's a complex term, uh, it, it cuts both ways. So even the Dalits can be accused of this. Even the marginal, marginalized can be accused of uh, casteism uh, and so on, be accused of taking uh, uh, you know, reservations and so on. So if you think of the uh, simple uh, meanings uh, from a, a Telugu kind of context, uh, the term used is kulatattvam. Uh, it's a negative uh, term. Uh, of course, everyone is English kulatattvam. Uh, 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 a casteism. Everyone is against casteism. Uh, it also meant caste feeling, caste pride, caste hatred, caste arrogance. In the largest sense, uh, when Karan Chedu and other major massacres happened in the 70s, uh, there is also this whole uh, meaning of caste authority, caste power, and caste superiority. Uh, so the casteism really meant caste superiority, caste authority, and, 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 and caste power. And, and it's a structural ideal. It is not individual feelings of negative feelings of caste against somebody and so on. It is a structural uh, uh, kind of ideology. And uh, so not individual feelings. So here the agent is definitely after the 90s with the Dalit assertion, uh, uh, the, the agent is the upper caste, the Brahmins, and in many cases now the, the dominant caste, which includes uh, some OBC uh, dominant caste. So they, they seem to uh, have this what is called uh, the caste uh, uh, feeling uh, 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 and casteism and so on. Uh, so in this kind of a discussion, because of the power of the Dalit movement uh, uh, today, so it uh, nobody directly refers to the uh, uh, the Dalit caste and OBC saying that uh, you are also practicing caste and so on. But but literally, uh, if you think of the 90s scenario, so those who have caste identity, those who can actually uh, nurture caste uh, feelings caste hatred are only Dalits, only the, uh, the the marginalized caste, not the upper caste. Upper caste are completely secular and modern, and they don't have, so they have various kinds of democratic and so on. Uh, uh, so they don't have actually caste feeling. Uh, uh, so they have the luxury of uh, claiming, uh, uh, you know, anti-casteism and, and claiming secular identity. So if that is the meaning of casteism, so what is, uh, you know, anti-caste, uh, anti-casteism? So obviously it implies that you know, rejection of uh, caste, non-recognition of caste and caste identities. And of course, positively, if you want to think of it, anti-casteism as a fellow feeling, and of course, something that uh, has to do with human dignity and, and equality uh, of individuals. In other words, uh, if, you, if you think of uh, the Ambedkar's uh, uh, definition of democracy uh, in relation of caste, 
uh, as he uh, describes it as an, an attitude of uh, respect and reverence towards uh, fellow uh, fellow men. So obviously, so we are talking about when we are talking about anti-democracy, uh, anti-casteism, we are talking about actually democracy, uh, 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 fellow feeling, uh, and and of course it implies uh, uh, inhalation of caste. So so Ambedkar clearly also has kind of uh, uh, defined for us what. Uh, actually, casteism meant, though he did not use the other kind of a term, because inhalation of uh, caste, inhalation of caste is, a, is, a, is is mostly a theoretical text, because most of the Marxists are understood as a programmatic text. There is a program uh, uh, to implement, but it's actually a theoretical uh, text which really tells us uh, the, the 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 meanings of caste and and the function of caste system, uh, which is static, which doesn't allow uh, mobility, no communication anti social spirit no fraternity and no public uh, spirit and in fact no society uh, 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 is possible and and in fact uh, so his own term would be graded uh, inequality uh, uh, and and if you don't follow this system and you you will be uh, punished uh, excommunication and so on and so forth and in fact so that is the ambedkar classical kind of position so he is for annihilation of not only castes but sub caste dalit caste untouchable caste i mean all the castes completely for a classical this is his position is a classical position where you want uh, the individual as, as a citizen and and democracy as an ideal so that is his goal where uh, there is no uh, kind of role for any of the caste identity or caste groups and including dalit identity like uh, as mira was referring that somebody is a abandoned dalit i found in the concept note also completely Dalit is left out. There is no min, min, mention of Dalit movement anywhere. There is no mention of Dalit identity anywhere in the concept note. So, which literally meant, of course, that is a new position now. The position which is uh, anti-caste position, which doesn't want the Dalit, doesn't want. So, in fact, if you, from my experience, this whole anti-casteism is possible because of the Dalit assertion in the 90s and, and and now. So, without the Dalit assertion, without the Dalit movement, I think there is no thinking of uh, anti-casteism uh, uh, for me. And then uh, more, I think, uh, if I have uh, two more minutes, so, so more recently, so from the Ambedkar's time to the present uh, Dalit movement. Uh, so this is a point that uh, uh, I would like more discussion is that there are these uh, sub-caste groups which also have raised this issue of, uh, if you like the term anti-casteism, are uh, you know equality uh, of the caste groups, so equality between these communities. So they have also accused of accused other sub caste as practicing uh, casteism. Uh, so the the more dominant uh, uh, caste, uh, more socially, culturally, educationally advanced uh, Dalit uh, groups uh, are scheduled caste, if you like. Uh, so those are actually enjoying benefits of reservations and so on. So those movements actually generated a new kind of an understanding. The understanding is that. That that you cannot not recognize the caste identity, and then the caste identity is not the same uh, as as for the upper caste person. Caste doesn't really literally mean caste identity. Doesn't literally mean uh, uh, you know uh, hierarchy and so on. So the caste could also be a cultural identity. Cats could could also take other kinds of meanings. So they have mobilized caste in, in very very different uh, ways because they have just made the central point that. The dignity of the individual is not possible unless the, there is a dignity of the community. If you don't recognize, for example, the, the Madigas uh, as a group worthy of uh, you know respect, then the individuals in that group will not uh, get respect. I think uh, with this, I'll stop. Thank you, Satyanal. Already, already there are, uh, I can see underlying some of your statements, I feel potential misunderstanding certainly a uh, misunderstanding of my position so i would i would want to say straight away i 100% agree with you that caste is is has to be understood structurally uh, and for me it isn't just about what people believe it is about how caste is totally embedded this is going to be my second round of questions about the modernity of caste but i i see what you're saying about suspicion of anti casteism but one of the things which I also write about and want people to think about is the simulation of caste blindness, which is what a lot of upper caste so-called anti-casteists say. They just pretend to be caste blind. And it's not even pretension, it's deeper than that, actually. They don't think they are pretending. They actually think that they believe that they are caste blind. And that is a problem. So part of what 
anti-caste as a means for me is to unmask that. That to me is a very unethical way of, of uh, addressing the question of caste. So I think we will be after discussion on agreement on that. And uh, if, if you allow that uh, it is possible for someone who is not uh, born as a victim directly of um, casteism to be able to think about caste in this way that you know i i i think that uh, it's very much in uh, uh, both an ethical as well as an intellectual and political commitment to to address this um, question head on and nobody can take i in my i feel that nobody can take uh, a pri make a priority claim on uh, talking about casteism every it's everybody's responsibility everybody who is a part of the caste world is equally responsible and everybody must talk about casteism how it affects them and how it affects other people so I, i'll leave, leave that there for a minute so balmurli murli what no, are no, you no, no. Before what? Murli, I, I just want to clarify yeah Mena, i just want to clarify so i'm not referring to you at all because this anti-casteism has a long history uh, with the the left has been using so there's a long history within the indian context which i'm referring to not at all referring to you that's my clarification so, Murli, let's, uh, uh, what do you think about Andhikaasism? Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm obviously entering what we all always know to be a minefield in some ways. And uh, to be following Professor Satinarana is, uh, is an honor to me. So uh, maybe you're referring to some people like me, Satya. So, so mm -hmm. I, will, I will invite uh, woe on me. So I first want to start off by uh, thanking the organizers, especially Professor Maito, for inviting me. And it's an honor really to be on a panel with uh, Satya and both the Meenas. Um, <clears throat> and the topic of this panel is, of course, about reflections. And that's what my remarks will be. Therefore, uh, in my weak way, I am going to disclaim that they are not formulations of any kind. They will not be tidy. And they are meant to be opening and not closing the way. And for that's the nature of the topic. And I'm conscious of entering the space that Professor Satya has carefully indicated is rife with problems. And I would uh, also add that, uh, and I mean, ever with some of the others, that uh, it's uh, we need to pay some attention to the structure of casteism and not um, only the ways in which prejudice or things like that uh, seem to work. Uh, and I would like to, uh, at the outset, say that I've thought about casteism in my own work, uh, um, both in um, theory as well as in solidarity, uh, as a set of practices that enable the monopolization of uh, power, wealth, and status, uh, all three. And so it's uh, um, uh, it works along with all the other things that we've talked about so far. But in the spirit of the discrepancy, in the in the way the um, conference has been described, and uh, of course it's an incredibly thoughtful conference, and I'm quite amazed at the at the number of papers that have been there. I'm I I I have unfortunately not been able to attend uh, most of it, but I do intend to hear them all. Uh, but I consider the term anti-casteism without a hyphen uh, to get back to something that we now talking about the language uh, as a provocation for a deeper discussion and. Um, and in another context, which was a review of the uh, around the film Jai Bhim Comrade, I had argued that anti-caste solidarities needed to be viewed uh, with a lot of punctuation, so uh, punctuated solidarity, so that Jai Bhim Comrade needed a hyphen and a comma or even a period. That's what I felt in 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 between the terms Jai Bhim and Comrade in order to generate a productive tension for thinking about how resisting subjects can come together for a political project while acknowledging the different subjectivities as shaped by caste. So in contrast to that, I welcome the rejection of the hyphen in anti-casteism, which is usually placed after the anti. Uh, and uh, for this enables, uh, in my opinion, the term anti-casteism to avoid, and I know Satya is going to have, have his uh, uh, Antony here, I think it helps us avoid um, an imagination that the fight 
uh, the good fight is only against casteism, but not really against caste. Uh, and so an unhyphenated anti-casteism therefore means that we need to be working to both annihilate caste, which is one kind of a social group, knowing that there are other kinds of social groups, um, and as well as casteism, which is a social practices for apart from other things, uh, monopolizing power, status, and wealth. So for caste and casteism, to me, are uh, tied structurally to the hip. Casteism, I would argue, incessantly produces castes, uh, the social group, as a structured set of relations. Uh, so in deference also to the fact that there's a conference put together by scholars of language, uh, we can also remind ourselves that terms, such as anti-casteism, in this case, get their meanings through differentiating themselves from other terms. Uh, therefore, anti-casteism to me, uh, I feel needs some distinction from three other clusters of terms. And uh, I just want to highlight what I'm going to say now, that each of these terms, to my mind, are uh, frames uh, uh, for defying, if not resisting uh, uh, casteism, at least according to the actors who use these terms. Uh, actually, some of these terms are my own terms to refer to actions that are done by uh, many groups of people. So the first uh, thing I would say is anti-casteism. Uh, I would not misrecognize that as a struggle for what I would call as a caste-based democracy. That is competitive electoral and political jockeying for greater caste representation, especially of marginalized castes, uh, or even what Jafarlo has called the silent India silent revolution. And while all of that had their own positive impacts on people's lives. Uh, Anti-casteism instead, for me, is based on a view of a democracy without caste. For caste is antithetical to any substantive sense of democracy. So that would be the first distinction. The second one I would make is that anti-casteism needs to be distinguished from a discourse that dominates thinking about caste today, and it has been <clears throat> uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I have called this in my own work as um, caste without casteism discourse, which gives rise to what I've called uh, multiculturalism of caste. Uh, this, this discourse comes from a uh, wide range, liberal, conservative, as well as right wing assertions of caste, exclusively seen as identity or even caste pride. Uh, while simply denying the fact of inequality and casteism. So castes can exist without casteism in this kind of a discourse. And uh, that is enabled by the social process, what I've called the culturalization of caste, so that it becomes possible to celebrate castes as benign identities, which can't regard to how such celebration itself is a form of casteism. And this enters the dangerous terrain put out by uh, Professor Satyanarayana. Um, especially my last uh, uh, thing that uh, maybe it could be, um, and it is that many Dalit groups who are fighting for dignity are accused of casteism. Now, that's not personally my implication of identifying caste without, caste without casteism, because I, I want to emphasize that culturalization, at least the way I have uh, used it, is seen as a depoliticization of caste and hence is a key form of the legitimation of casteism under multicultural conditions. So whereas anti-casteism repoliticizes caste and is a political project, which is directly at odds with the discourse of caste without casteism. But then the third thing that I'll distinguish myself is precisely entering the terrain of uh, Satya. So I feel anti-casteism must also be distinguished from another discourse, one that has emerged from the other end of the political spectrum, from right-wing, liberal, and all of that. And this is from the oppressed, marginalized, subaltern uh, caste groups, and as a radical approach to resist casteism. And I have called this discourse caste against casteism, as opposed to the earlier one, which is caste without casteism. And unlike that earlier trope, this one finds the need to assert and preserve, especially subaltern caste identities, in order to combat casteism. And a large part of this has to do with dignity. And as Professor Satyanarana talked about, is the recognition of dignity of the community 
And so what is a community? In this case, it's a caste community. However, in my, in my uh, humble um, submission, this discourse also runs into several problems, not that others don't have problems, but this too has problems. Uh, and not the least of that being a reproduction of the logics of casteism and culturalization. While it may even be possible to reclaim some of the tools from the house of capitalism to resist capitalism, it would be hard to do that, in my opinion, with casteism. The logics of caste are endlessly divisive. We would do well to heed Audre Lorde's, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm just going to repeat something that it seems to be overly repeated. So at that risk, it's a cautionary note that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house, even if it seems promising for anti casteist mobilization in the short term. Um, so caste cannot be used to resist casteism since it is casteism that creates caste and not the other way around. Anti casteism to me, therefore, is a rejection of this position. Uh, but it needs to be a sympathetic rejection and i think that that to me uh, is a lot of work for non dalit uh, populations and it strikes at the root of a longing and a belonging for caste as a comforting home for anyone including the oppressed that is anti casteism and it requires ultimately that caste identities to be shed in this project and a major implication of this and i'll end with this you know, is um, of of such a position, and uh, maybe it is um, you know classical. Maybe it is. I don't think it is unreformed. Satya, in my own defense, I would uh, preempt that. Uh, I think it is not an unreformed position. But a major implication of this position is that the category Dalit needs to be viewed. Uh, and I've written also about this as an anti-caste identity and not simply as a term that refers to Dalit caste groups. But this also in turn implies that people from non-Dalit caste groups need to think about caste conscious anti-casteism. Uh, we need that caste consciousness to counter the caste blindness or the glib castelessness that we are all too aware is, is the problem. So anti-casteism anti then I would offer means for non-Dalit folks to Dalitize. Uh, and, and of course that needs to be unpacked. That is to, but to me it means to take the position uh, from the perspective of Dalit caste groups, which are the only ones, uh, as far as I can tell, the only ones who are objectively positioned to have the ability to imagine and do the politics of annihilation of caste. Nobody else has it, objectively speaking. So there's a lot of work for non-Dalit groups in that sense. But I'm going to leave it at that for now. Yes, thank you. I I think we are we could have this discussion for a very long time if we had if we had the time. And uh, already there are. Uh, so many ideas that have come in and very broadly in sympathy with uh, with what you've said, uh, um, Balmurli. And um, uh, I, I do think that um, it's important to differentiate what anti-casteism should be and what it is. And also, as you said, uh, it's casteism creates caste, which reminds me of something Judith Butler says about gender, you know, similar, similar, uh, what comes first, you know, it's uh, gender comes afterwards, this is sexism, which comes first, uh, which, which creates gender. And I think this is, this is uh, quite similar in, in that respect. So the power, the hierarchy, the structure, the inferiorization, that is first. And then what we understand, what we the categories we make come afterwards. So that, that's just the way you understand uh, the relationship between life and theory. And and I think the the life of inferiorization comes first. Uh, and I think part of what you want to um, uh, and part of uh, Malini has a hand raised. Is there a reason, Malini? You are interrupting. Oh, or is it a mistake? Okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to invite Malini to speak just yet. Uh, okay, so um, the next round of questions, which which will uh, I think touch upon some of the things that Balmurli and uh, has just raised, and what Satyendra and Nina has have raised before, 
And this time I'm going to ask Satya Narayana to go first. Okay, so your chance for us to answer. What does modernity of caste mean? And how significant is positionality? So Mudri has into that uh, the fact that really at the, at the forefront of the struggle uh, against caste, uh, uh, it's only Dalits who are objectively placed to do it. Everybody else has to Dalitize, is his term he's using. Um, uh, so how significant is positionality? And um, alongside, maybe you also want to say how might, um, if you agree with some version of anti castism that uh, how would you align it with other struggles? That's, and I do have one other question, which uh, maybe you want to um, deal with now or, or later. What are the most severe obstacles to advancing anti castism So we can see already that uh, one obstacle is just getting our understanding of what we mean by anti castism And if we are uh, not in agreement, that would be an obstacle to actually building any kind of solidarity. Uh, but they might, they are real world obstacles as well, given the kind of world we are in living in now. And um, because uh, the two projects uh, of all these things are simultaneously happening, caste without casteism and caste against casteism, these are happening. These are not just theoretical position that Burli, you have differentiated anti casteism form. They, they are different formations. There are people who are in their own ways trying to uh, engage in the project of annihilation of caste uh, to a more or less uh, effective uh, extent. So, um, so we need to then see well, what uh, kind of common understanding we might be able to develop. Uh, given that, I think very broadly speaking, if we out of a spirit of charity and generosity, assume that we all are in in a very broadly defined same fight. Okay, so, so Satin Ryan, you. Yeah, no, first, uh, first let me uh, clarify that, uh, you know, I'm not saying uh, uh, anti castism is not important. But generally, what happens in these discussions is that I'm actually speaking. Uh, like an activist or a scholar, but it turns out to be as though I am speaking to the upper caste non dalit as a Dalit. So therefore, okay. And so that kind of a uh, subject position comes up uh, in the discussion, which I am really uh, surprised why this uh, uh, happens. And also it's assumed that that uh, I'm opposing uh, uh, anti casteism What I'm basically saying is that we have to be careful with that because it has a, a history and, and people have used it. People have used it and they have been using it, the anti-casteism. Anti-casteism is the easiest kind of position in India people to take uh, without investing anything, without investing any way in working with other people. So, of course, I, mean, I thank Morali for uh, complicating that and, and really uh, uh, addressing uh, that point and clarifying uh, uh, that point. And uh, so, uh, yeah. So when it comes to uh, uh, the project of uh, modernization and, and caste, uh, uh, so in fact, I have several uh, uh, examples. One example would be uh, uh, the atrocities in the uh, developed regions, whether it is elsewhere in the country or in Andhra Pradesh or in uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, and more recently, I don't know whether you have followed the news, uh, there is a place, actually this is a place, my own native place, uh, Amalapuram, uh, uh, there is a district in other place named uh, Ambedkar, Ambedkar district. So initially it was called Konasima district and now the government uh, designated it as Ambedkar Konasima district. And uh, there the Dalits are educationally very well developed, they are in the industry, they are in the uh, uh, politics, they have gone to the Gulf. I mean, I would say they are the most powerful Dalits uh, of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana together. I mean, they are the most articulate most of the IS officers, engineers from the community. But once this announcement was made, there was such a, a huge violence and consolidation of uh, uh, the both the uh, OBC caste groups and the upper caste groups. And completely, I mean, they have the courage to go and attack even the cabinet minister of a Dalit minister in Amlapuram and burn his house. They completely burnt his house 
and and uh, sent him out of the house and police have to protect him and the virtual kind of division in terms of dalit versus i mean dalit broadly meaning the there the malas are dominant and there are some madigas so malas and madigas versus the others and, and simply uh, 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 because of this naming that that this kind of a uh, thing happened so in fact i would have never imagined that in amlapuram in such a modern uh, kind of a location such a highly educated uh, dalit population and others uh, in that area uh, any kind of uh, incident like this would happen nothing sort of atrocity in fact they have not killed anyone they attacked some people but if it escalates i think they would uh, kill and wipe out uh, the entire uh, dalits so in a way that that the modernization uh, of the indian uh, state uh, which really helped the dalits to come up and their own migration their own other initiatives and their own uh, you know uh, the agra agrarian connections land ownership all that really uh, uh, helped them um, but similarly the same very development the movement once a political party decides to name them as a potential vote bank and they want to call it ambedkar district and then mobilize malas behind the ycp then it it turns into some kind of a uh, you know in a completely battle field so this sharpening of caste identities completely kind of sharpening of i mean uh, the, the uh the deep rooted casteism and anger uh, uh and then burning a specific shops uh and and so this kind of a uh, caste polarization in fact I, i i thought that there is only a, some kind of a cultural identity caste identity is only merely some kind of a superficial cultural identity in that reason because i i also visit that place i never feel uh, 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 any kind of untouchability anywhere but but obviously there is a lot of discussion in terms of uh, uh, how Uh, 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 this whole project of state modernization led to these kinds of uh, 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 complete sharp uh, divisions and, and and violence. I think that's the first point that I wanted to make in relation to uh, modernization and, and Dalits. So deeply contradictory kind of a process uh, which leads to uh, uh, these kinds of uh, 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 violence and so on. Uh, then the the other uh, point is that in terms of Uh, uh uh the anti casteism uh, uh as, as a project or our uh, annihilation of caste or our democracy as, as a kind of a project uh then so my point is that this is a point that i wanted to clarify to murali for a long time but murali never takes this point into consideration he always thinks i am advocating some kind of identity politics and that the caste groups will be fighting i will be supporting them and, and therefore so he wants to say okay i take that the caste groups fighting is also good so i'm not saying that what i'm saying is that if you want to think of anti casteism or caste annihilation you have to de- deal with the forces on the ground in the forces on the ground organized on caste uh, levels and and also because you are in the modern domain with a liberal democracy with the vote bank politics so the malas and madigas and holeyas and others and others were so they are all consolidated as caste groups initially as caste pride initially as solidarity initially as uh, you know demands for respect dignity and and of course the recognition of their culture their myths the leaders that is how it is i mean that's how they they really mobilize and consolidate but the way that the liberal democracy and state because they they cannot operate outside the modern domain of politics and the way they use them they distort them and they completely kind of uh, use one against the other it's completely kind of it's very difficult so one way that we tried uh, when we said we had this caste and relation forum is that actually take up the issues of each of these caste groups and bring them and then of course talk to them about class i talk about talk to them about gender or talk to them other things but first of all you you recognize them as you know uh, as a valid human kind of a group bring them into your own uh, this thing and try to talk them but but we really fail even there because the political parties have have money and other other kinds of uh, things so i don't know if i uh, have time uh, uh, one more minute i think i'll stop here and i'll come back to that thank you that is the main point thank you thank you satyanarayan i think i think we are getting a better sense and we should appreciate what does uh, identity politics really mean and I, i'll just flag here a really interesting new work which is coming from race angle and it's is uh, a book by olifimio taibu called uh, elite capture and i think that's a that's a really interesting book which is 
uh, I've only got glimpses of it, which is talking about how identity politics is hijacked by those who are, uh, you know, in a position of privilege. So there is a point to where identity politics begins from. And so Satyan in what you are saying that, you know, we have to locate that in the context of a struggle for dignity. And but I think we should concede that uh, the path towards annihilation of caste is not a straight one. You know, it, you might be going in circles or, or a zigzag path, you know, and that's something we have to accept. It's uh, so uh, it's only some people who can afford to or pretend that they can now be free of caste. And actually, that's not going to happen. Not until all of us are free of caste or not until, uh, you know, our social structure is what becomes one which does not uh, uh, use caste as uh, or caste identities or caste differentiation or caste hierarchies until such time we are condemned to live in this in this way and uh, so yeah i think i i think i can see the the point of um, uh, focusing more on what organization on the ground requires uh, and and by the way i am for the caste census just to make my position clear on this one. I am not of the view that you shouldn't do caste census because, quote unquote, it will entrench caste. I don't buy that, uh, you know. So uh, I want to move now to Nina. Nina, you very provocatively talked about um, in your first opening comment about counter violence as well, which is which uh, we we haven't picked up, uh, Satyana and Murli haven't picked up, but I think it's quite a a key position, key point that you make, and both in your writings as well, uh, you know, one one finds that, and uh, you say that it is something which uh, creates confidence, uh, and and I think again, uh, whilst we might aspire for a world in which there is no room for or no need for violence, but we are living in one which is thoroughly imbued with violence, so. Uh, it's a similar sort of problem that we face as we face with identity politics. You know what to do with what to do with violence. So I'll ask you to uh, Mina, what do you, what does modernity of caste mean to you, and uh, how do you think an anti casteism be aligned with other struggles? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so in terms of modernity, I'll keep my comments short. I think that Dalit movements have been very central to imagining and constructing modernity in the Indian context because you know you, they, we have a Hindu right which argues that the you know the Indian constitution is not Indian enough and they want to cling on to the old ways and they want a harmonious interdependence of caste. That's uh, the sum up of what RSS BJP stands for and so it has been left to Dalit movements to demand and struggle for meaningful change from below. So you know even to articulate this you know the Dalit and uh, the necessity of modern, the, the modernity project just look at the way you know they handle uh, Hindu texts, and I'm not even going back to Ambedkar or Ayutthaya Panditar, but you know uh, debates around the status of women, the Hindu code bill, an issue over which Ambedkar designed, or on the issue of temples, the issue of love jihad, and all of this, you see that the right is working to render women passive. And it is the articulation uh, from the Dalit movements who are, you know, giving a very clear and forceful critique of Manu and the demand for gender equality. So I, I, I want to centralize, you know, the role of Dalit movements in uh, Indian modernity. That's one of the things. And in terms of, uh, I also wanted to quickly, before I go on to uh, talk about, you know, what are the how can anti-casteism align with other struggles? I want to take something said by both Professor Satya Narana and uh, Professor Balamurli Narajan. The thing is, um, you know, people, and I'm speaking from experience of, you know, reading texts about uh, Periyar, the self-respect movement, the Dravidian movement, subsequently the Liberation Panthers and all of them. So originally they did talk about Jati Mariputirumanam, you know, the caste denying marriage you know, where people from different caste groups come together and have a marriage, you know, so it was called Jadi Marupu, means I deny caste. And so, you know, my own parents did a Jadi Marupu Tiramanam. And recently I was asked to write a small bio in Tamil and I sent this to my father uh, and I said, what do you think of my Tamil? Is it good? And he said, oh, don't call us a Jadi Marupu Tiramanam or a caste denying marriage. You should, you should use the word Jadi Uriputirumanam or a caste annihilating marriage. 
so the fact is that you know for a long time in the self respect movement we have been going through where we say yes it is an anti caste marriage we could also translate jati marup as anti caste uh, or it means technically the word is denying caste or uh, you know so the thing is that uh, or opposing caste marup can also mean opposing in tamil so going from opposing caste or denying caste to this place where you know we talk and uh, this is again i think some of the work of uh, it comes from periyar but it also comes much more from the liberation panthers pidithala chirutigal have one tag line and their tag line is jaadi ulippe makkal vidudalai so people's liber caste annihilation is people's liberation so when i think when we talk about anti caste we might as well say annihilate caste i know it is a very cumbersome problem of you know too many words but we are all you know having to have have you know like we would never have imagined we would live in a world where you know pronouns would become so important we this is so we cannot restrict our imagination to you know to go towards democracy so i believe that if we have to talk about the uh, you know annihilation of caste we might as well just keep talking about the annihilation of caste and i also here want to talk about um, this question that you know um, professor nadrajan spoke about which is uh, you know using dalit as a term of um, you know anti caste or annihilation of caste as opposed to a caste identity and uh, uh, professor satyanarayan's work which is about passing i don't know much about it but i was recently reading um the memoir of geeta ramaswamy and she says that when she was working in the slums she would apparently go and identify herself as the lowest sub caste that existed or caste group that existed among the madiga uh, and once she was in somebody's home and she said that she would you know use that as a way to and i think that uh, as a phenomena you know passing or claiming to be um i would personally never have seen my father in 40 years talk about his personal caste but it was very normal in the 80s and 90s we don't live anymore or even in the 70s we don't live in the same world where you know uh, even for people who transgress caste and he comes from a nomadic tribe um, to talk about you know you could exist in social circles in anti caste circles in uh, you know um, in far left circles or whatever circles without having to articulate individual caste identity because there were other you know uh, like you hear the elam movement or sympathy to elam movement so you could identify yourself with struggles without having to articulate your caste but that that has obviously changed and with that comes the question of you know what is caste and this is a question that i always talk about and always fight with all my friends and i wanted to share this example because it is literally plague my life so the question is i go to you know my friends periyar's friends and say okay so somebody who is shudra marries somebody who is a nomadic tribe and why do you want to say and they have what is uh, periyarist arranged this wedding the marriage takes place in the presence of periyaris so why would you give caste to the the child because when they want to anti caste marriage why does the child get a caste so and the question is periyar has done so many anti caste marriages the history of self respect movement from 1925 is this anti caste movements but nobody thought or forethought the question of what is the caste of the child so you know nobody decided these children are casteless or they should say you know they belong to a lower caste or they belong to an outcast or there's a separate caste category so nobody addressed this question and then uh, so because if if this child also has the father's caste then what's the point of this marriage my father might as well have married within his caste if the child has the mother's caste what is the point of my mother's transgression she might have as well married in her caste so the fact that two people were trying to post caste and marrying across caste lines what does it mean to two of them when you know the child has to be burdened with one or the other identity why can't it be neither of them so and i speak about and i also fight about this with tiruma because i say what is your position on this you go on you have all of these marriages taking place and what is you know what happens to the child what is this as a political project what do you call them so there are a lot of schemes for instance in tamil nadu government that help people children of inter caste couples they have reservations they have you know you can access jobs this all of this that exists this system exists but in terms of identity nobody addresses it and i think the closest answer that i've got from tiruma is that you should talk about political dalitness so he would tell me whatever your caste is or whatever it is not you are politically a dalit because you stand for anti caste work and he says this not just to me he says this on meetings he says that anybody who opposes or and he wants to annihilate the caste system is dalit anybody who fights against hindutva is dalit so this but i again think that this kind of political blackness uh, political dalitness could become problematic because you know in and meena that lives in the uk so she must know political blackness at some point included asian people uh you know when the unions and organizations in the 70s and 80s in the uk but nobody now you know i don't think any asian person would 
call themselves black, even though originally I think the word the way the word black was deployed was different. So I'm not sure again how much thought through this is, you know, the concept of political Dalitans. I wanted to add this as well. And in terms of I do I have a minute more or I've taken too much time. Mm, one minute. I muted. You can take two minutes from no, me. No, no, okay. Go sorry, sorry. Uh, take as long as you like. No worries. Just two minutes. I, I want to finish it here. So now, uh, uh, going up away from uh, positionality and political Dalithood, I here want to talk about how does anti casteism align with other struggles. And here I think that um, anti casteism actually in Tamil Nadu, the Dalit movement, and very speci specifically Vidhala Chirutagal, has actually given us the space to, you know, kind of identify yourself as Tamil feminist. Because until this attack came from them saying, you know, Manusmriti, you're insulting religion. You don't think that Tamil women in the 21st century want to talk about Manusmriti anymore. But the fact that Hindutva upholds it, you know, allows us the space to actually come and say, no, 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 we are Tamil women, we are against Manusmriti, we are against what you call. So I think that in, in a sense, the Dalit movement or the anti-caste annihilation of caste movement, and for me, the movement to annihilate caste, can is of course led by the Dalits, is led by Ambedkar's ideas, and I would call it a Dalit movement. I don't think I would feel two ways about it. When I mean Dalit movement, I mean the movement to annihilate caste. And when I mean anti casteism, I mean the movement to annihilate caste. So um, I, 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 I think it's a particular case scenario in Tamil Nadu because of how um, they have managed to handle this. So, and when I talk about this kind of thing, it does open this space for women to, you know, again launch their own attack and organized. Uh, Hindutva subjugation of their position. So I do think it aligns and not because, you know, feminists organized by themselves and went and said, okay, we are going to oppose Hindutva, but it was the Dalit movement that even gave feminists the space to articulate what is happening. So I do think that it aligns in that sense. And in the other sense, I also think that it aligns uh, in opposing or uprooting or fighting Hindutva. So you may ask, what is the connection between the annihilation of caste and Hindutva? And here we have to understand, I want to speak from two different perspectives. One is the on the ground perspective, which is that um, Hindutva is working over time to sharpen caste identities. So they want us to consolidate as Hindus, but they want to sharpen each caste identity, which enables them to, you know, keep this, you know, Sanatana Dharma, whatever alive, but also allows them to keep tensions alive. And as long as each caste is consolidated, it allows them an easy vote bank. It also ensures that, you know, this caste pride, whatever assertion that comes irrespective of which caste it is, it means that, you know, endogamy will be more strictly followed, women can be more easily subjugated. And then they also lead into a kind of, you know, regimentation of caste, like it's not only Brahmins who now have to wear the same, who continue to wear the sacred thread, but, you know, every caste is now, you know, in the south, in the south of Tamil Nadu, tying a caste thread. So all of the slow assertions of you know visible symbols of caste come from Hindu. So on the on the other on the one hand, annihilation of caste becomes aligned to the struggle to uproot Hindutva. And the second way is uh, the theoretical framework. I, I have not read much much of sociologists on this. Possibly my bad reading, but I think there was this uh, paper by Jean Dres on understanding Hindutva as the revolt of the upper caste and saying that. Uh, and I quote him: "The surge of Hindu nationalism in India can be seen as a revolt of the upper caste." against the egalitarian dem demands of democracy. The Hindutva project is a lifeboat for the upper caste insofar as it promises to restore the Brahminical social order. And so here, when you understand larger movements, you know, the movements against reservation or, or the way in which Hindutva pushes back against any kind of, you know, democratic space for Dalits, um, I think that it's very important to understand that it is the Dalit movement, the anti-caste movement or the annihilation of caste movement uh, that can be the most uh, a powerful opponent to Hindutva politics. And we see that in Tamil Nadu. So Hugo and I have a paper somewhere about how the VCK uh, is the challenge to the BJP. And uh, we also, you know, it's not just a theoretical formulation. Uh, there are cherries in Tamil Nadu where the VCK, the, where the cadres of the VCK and the people of the cherry, the Dalit people of the cherry, basically practically chase out the BJP from entering. So I, I, I see this as a very, it, it, it is not, uh, you know, theory flowing into protest, but I, talk about protest and actual happenings on the ground. And even on 14th of April, you know, the BJP, the VCK was fighting 
and pelting stones uh, and you know opposing the bjp right to even garland ambedkar saying who are you to garland ambedkar and i think it's a very important question it fights against the appropriation of ambedkar so there was a scuffle and there was you know so <laughs> you talked about violence earlier so this is the kind of you know active on the ground resistance to you know the hindutva project and i think that has to be a project of annihilation of caste because that's what hindutva at the, at the end wants to uphold i'm going to stop here thank you Thank you, Meena. Uh, and now we are going to uh, listen to Murli answer the same questions about what does modernity of caste mean. I think you have already said quite a bit in your in, in your book, culturalization of caste. You know uh, what that means. But it'd be good for people who are joining us here to hear from you. And uh, and how can you align anti caste struggles with the other struggles? Uh, particularly relevant for you, based in the USA, uh, how might it be linked to anti-racial struggle, for instance? Um, and um, so, yeah, when we come back, maybe to a final round as well. Uh, I'll just try and keep this short. Um, so, uh, on the modernity thing, uh, uh, I mean, one of the ways that is attractive to me to think about modernity is what the philosopher uh, Jonathan Ganeri um, said is a distinctive trait, uh, and, and I'm quoting a fundamental shift in attitude towards the ancient, no longer one of deference. The new attitude is to enter into conversation with, to learn from ancient sources, but not to be beholden to them, end quote. And so modernity of caste demands that we think about caste and not just do it. And that process, we produce accounts of how caste is a problem and creating and admitting to caste as a problem, calling caste as a problem, calling caste as violence, naming it for what it is. All of that to me is already modernity and quite unlike uh, and exactly what Meena uh, earlier talked about the BJP's attitude about traditions and things like that. So uh, we are we are in modern times with caste because of our attitude towards caste, uh, which at least in the dominant way is, is a critique of caste. And then, we don't want to be beholden to it. We may not know how to not be beholden to it. Uh, and definitely it's not a linear thing. But I also feel modernity of, of I mean, modernity with respect to caste needs to um, be clear, if it's possible, uh, about how caste has changed over time. Uh, we don't need to call that as the modernization of caste if we don't want to, but definitely the legitimations of caste have changed over time and i would argue um you know so the uh, key forms of legitimation which kind of coexist with the key changing forms of caste itself would be uh, the forms of legitimation would be brahmanism sanskritization and culturalization let's say and each of them is saying slightly different things for example brahmanism would be saying you are not like us um you are lower than us and you can and and that's the way it's going to be uh, sanskritization gives a little bit of a chimera uh, that well you are not like us um, you are lower than us uh, but you can try and imitate some of the things that we do and of course that never really ends up so it's a kind of a legitimization of caste too and culturalization uh, says you are definitely not like us but it tries to avoid saying you're lower than us because it just wants to portray it as a uh, difference. And, uh, but it kind of essentializes that and it's very mixophobic. And in that it gives away the game, but they're all different ways of legitimizing uh, caste. And we need to be open to thinking about caste itself as adapting uh, in form as well as in its own legitimation uh, to modernity. I want to completely underscore uh, something, uh, you know, that uh, my two other panelists have said that uh, anti-casteism has to be conjugated if we want to use a term that um, the anthropologist Philippe Bourgois used a while ago. It has to be conjugated with anti-patriarchy, anti, and I would say even anti-imperialism. For example, as Anand Teltumde talks about uh, uh, the the way in which class-based movements come into play and also today anti-fascist movements. So uh, this is a consequence of um, viewing caste as, as a overdetermined 
reality. It doesn't operate in a vacuum, but it always operates alongside and in concert with capital, class, patriarchy, sexuality, uh, and some of which even constitute it. So, I mean, I think in some way, ways, uh, I would like to um, um, say that you cannot imagine casteism without patriarchy. So patriarchy is at least one of the constitutive moments of casteism. And so anti-casteism in that sense cannot be an independent movement in a vacuum. It will not succeed. I also want to underscore that anti-casteism needs to go way beyond discrimination or any legal based thing because caste uh, and because casteism is embedded in social life. Uh, and uh, so the singular focus on discrimination, uh, as important as it is, is restrictive since both, uh, since, for example, monopolization that I said, which is a way of looking at what casteism does, monop it, it allows a monopolization of power, wealth and status along caste groups. Monopolization does not, is not able to come under the radar, on the radar of the legal uh, discrimination. Uh, so uh examples for I, I mean whereas we can try and persecute uh the killings of um dalit men and women for daring to love or marry marry non dalits uh, we are uh, unable to persecute same caste marriages uh, i mean that is not illegal uh, but same caste marriages act as a bulwark for the reproduction of caste identity and therefore they lay the foundation for caste monopolies to continue to operate with power and wealth. And similarly, while we can persecute uh, caste-based discrimination at the workplace, um, and this is increasingly also uh, interestingly coming up in the South Asian uh, diaspora, uh, especially in the US and the UK. But while we can do that, we find it harder to break, uh, for example, the referral system of recruitment in corporate uh, workplaces because referral systems act as caste-based social capital for we know that friends and friendship is also shaped by caste so if you're going to refer to somebody it's very likely that it's already structured by caste um, and I would uh, then say uh, maybe I'll just end with this that um, why is this casteism uh, I mean apart from the fact that there are many sites of anti-casteism uh, simply because there's immense variation uh, and in some ways caste is a localized localized or regionalized phenomena. Um, so there will be multiple struggles in multiple ways in different ways. But I think one of the other reasons why it gets complicated is um, caste and casteism are fictions that have acquired the fixity of fact. Uh, what I mean by that then is that Castes as social groups, as social realities, are cultural constructions. They are imagined, uh, you know, groups that are way beyond what people can trace their ancestry and things like that. And uh, so they are, um, uh, in some ways, they have to be naturalized. They cannot escape uh, um, being existing without being naturalized. And uh, so. Anti-casteism for me is, is always already a resistance to caste as a material symbol that generates its own form of legitimation. Uh, and that sometimes makes it a little uh, tricky to, to pinpoint in some ways. But I'll probably end there and hopefully I haven't taken too much of time. Thank you. Uh, I think we can move to... Um... A couple of questions which are there in the chat box and they are open questions so any one of you can answer so i'll read the first one um, to fight against caste and casteism does it need to involve the upper caste people because they always try to occupy and in fact most of the time they occupy the space of the anti-caste movement instead of working within their caste group for this cause they are more inclined to work on these anti-caste struggles of the Dalit community so uh, this is a question about positionality and also about strategy I guess uh, in terms of uh, an anti-caste movement it's also about um, entitlement so all of you are 
uh, invited to if you want to individually also answer this question. Should we should we start with the um, Satya Narayan, will you answer this question, please? Or do you want to pass it on and I'll ask Meena or Murli to answer? Yeah, yeah, please, I'll pass it on and I'll come back later. OK. So Meena, do you want to say? Does it need to involve, does the fight against caste and casteism, does it need to involve the upper caste people? Because they always try to occupy the space of anti-caste movement. Uh, you need to unmute Mina. you need to unmute yes 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 i did that i did that i'm sorry uh, yeah. i wasn't looking so the thing is um i, I want to come to this question in a different way um the co the, co the question does uh, uh you know the question does arise can somebody just come in and dominate a movement but that that means you think that you know the anti-caste movement or the dalit movement is so weak that you know, just one caste Hindu or upper caste person or one Brahmin can come and you know hijack it. I don't think that mass movements, especially mass movements of and uh, uh, of Dalit politics, who seek to annihilate caste, are you know, <laughs> they're not brainless. They're absolutely aware of what they're doing, uh, and I don't think the presence of individual Brahmins uh, should become very problematic. You know, so uh, this uh, this kind of you know the presence of one or two people can exist because of you know again some rare friendship network some rare network like ambedkar's uh, second partner happened to be brahmin i don't think that can be held against him or doesn't in any way dilute what he's trying to do so i think that that question uh, you know the question of um, will they hijack these spaces this does exist and i also do not believe necessarily in um, stay in your lane type of politics like telling somebody you no know, just because you know uh, you don't be, because the thing is the, the who are the people who are the upper caste who are coming to do this kind of work um, uh, and uh, are what kind of work are they doing because they might be very interested in you know uh, working in some sort of NGO, in something that gives them exposure, something they can put on their CV. You know, I've actually seen young uh, Brahmin men say that, you know, they're working on this kind of thing because it's a thrust area, you know. So that is how they look at this work. But these type of people would be chased away, you know, like people would know, like people on the ground who spent years would know who is there for a sincere reason. So I do trust in the democracy of anti-caste movements, in the democracy of the an annihilation of caste struggle, to basically filter out this type of people. So I, that's the first point I want to come up, come to and the second thing is and this is very this is really really important and it bears so much repetition is that what, whichever movement you're talking about even if it is you know something like the Periyaris movement which is which is very pol politically powerful um, they you know Dravidian um, ideology still uh, dominates Tamil Nadu but the thing is we need people to work on them uh, we need people to translate. We need people to talk about this. We need people to theorize. It doesn't matter that, you know, just because somebody has captured power doesn't mean that, you know, they have managed to articulate themselves within the academy. Doesn't mean that, you know, they have managed to articulate themselves within even, let's say, the confines of Tamil Nadu. And so um, I think that, you know, the, the, the what contribution can somebody bring to annihilation of caste? And if they're interested in bringing it, I think this work is much more interesting to do than to... Um, you know, it's, it's quite easy to say, go on fighting the Thwa in your little thing. But this, you know, you talk something on a WhatsApp group, people are going to block you. You talk something. So, but this doesn't this doesn't have to be exclusive. You know, I don't think these are two mutually exclusive things. You can contribute to annihilation of caste movements. And at the same time, you can also oppose those who uphold Hindu Dwa, all your relatives who are upper caste. You can be both. So I don't think it's a question of choice. That's what I want to say on this. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just add a couple more points. I'm in broad agreement with what uh, Meena just said. Um, I think the, uh, in the spirit of the question, let me first say that there is a need for those who are from privileged castes to um, think about how they dominate and to change their behavior in that. And, and I know from the... Uh, inaugural uh, talk uh, uh, by uh, Professor Ayato Rai um, uh, and he talked about, for example, reparations. 
I'm uh, uh, completely on board with that. Uh, to make the case for reparations, one needs all kinds of people to work on it. I also want to uh, just submit out there that we need to think of anti casteisms in the plural. Um, as of now, I don't think that there is a one anti casteism movement. I'm not even sure how that would be woven given the complexity of variations of uh, um, who is the enemy, for example, uh, across different parts uh, of, of the country itself, if you want to think about that. But it's not only the country, because it's not restricted to that. And so there have to be ways in which um, definitely uh, um, uh, privileged castes need to uh, unpack their own privileges and uh, face the um, uh, I, sometimes it is easier to go out there and uh, convince ourselves that we're fighting against it and not do the hard work within our own families and uh, I am on board with all of that but having said all of that I somehow feel that the question of who 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 is an ally and what the solidarity mean can never be taken away from this for the simple fact that uh, casteism cannot be annihilated by Dalits alone. Uh, so it's a question of the leadership and centrality and all of those things I am on board with the spirit of that question. Uh, who should lead? Who should be in leadership positions? Uh, what does that mean? But uh, everyone needs to carry the burden and I'm not at all certain that the burden needs to be carried equally by everybody. Uh, Rajendra was very clear that uh, more of the burden, most of the burden has to be really carried by those who have enjoyed the privileges of this historical um, problem. Uh, so, yeah, I think that kind of exhausts the main points that I want to make. I completely agree with uh, the last two points that you made about, uh, yeah, of course, that there are kinds of anti casteism Actually, even from the right wing, there is one kind of anti casteism The Arya Samadhis also talk about anti casteism in their own way. And there is a deep problem with that, you know, for how they do it. So one has to, of course, link uh, um, anti casteism to uh, how it is possible to change lives in all the dimensions of life, not just in the religious and not just in terms of, uh, you know, your psychological makeup and so on. It's, everything has to change. So I, I do also think that uh, the question about um, carrying the burden and, and uh, um, combating one's own privilege is something that obviously the upper caste have to do themselves. So I will be very blunt on this. I don't think anyone can stop me from being an anti-casteist. Okay. So even if you think, you know, I have my own, I have my own way of, of wanting to it's a struggle with myself. It's a struggle with my inheritance. It's a struggle with, you know, uh, many things. So I don't think that, uh, and I think it is, um, it's my duty. It's my obligation. So I don't think that, uh, you know, because of this worry that I'll be told that, oh, you are trying to usurp somebody's position. No, maybe, maybe that's also something I have to live with the accusations and and you know maybe i have to it's a part of this the cost of having had the privilege that today i have to put my head down and say maro hai. right but i still have to do what i have to do so i think so this this positionality question is raised again and again and uh, about you know i for me if members of the dalit community are willing to want to work with me i will embrace them if some other members of dalit community think that i am going trespassing into an area i should not tough okay i will not go where i'm not wanted but there are many people who who realize the importance of forming solidarities across caste and that may happen maybe in very personal ways and that may happen maybe not in you know and so yeah absolutely leadership positions is a question of leadership position is an important one and to assume a spokesperson role is a wrong thing to do but 
to question the possibility of somebody who is upper caste to be engaged in an anti-caste struggle, I think, is, is not defensible. I, I would argue to the end if anyone wants to stop me from because of my caste position. So, um, yeah. uh, Satya Narayan, you go, please. Yeah. So, I, th I think the, uh, the underlying assumption uh, in that question is that uh, the assumption is that the anti-caste uh, uh, struggle is uh, uh, a struggle by the uh, Dalits. So whether uh, the non-Dalits will be allowed or not, I think that's how it is uh, posed. So in fact, if you uh, think of the history of uh, 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 the anti-caste struggles, uh, so you have uh, several other examples, uh, for example, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, have a, uh, a rationalist movement, which is a very old uh, kind of movement. 70s to 80s, which is which is led by, uh, incidentally, by uh, a very well-known Dalit leader, Kathakma Rao, and so on. And there are several other uh, organizations of that kind where I think anti-casteism is one uh, an important aspect of their work. And and uh, there there are uh, non-Dalits and there are others and so on. So this particular question comes up when the Dalit movement emerges on the scene and when you are building agitation. So there also have another example from Karnataka. Uh, where uh, uh, I think we also faced when we are setting up that organization. Uh, the Dalit uh, Sangharan Samti manifesto and died on organizational history uh, uh, kind of gave us some information. So Dalit Sangharan Samiti uh, explicitly uh, said uh, that it is an organization consisting of uh, mostly the Dalits, but it is also open to uh, the, the upper caste uh, uh, people, writers, anti-caste uh, 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 members who would like to join and so on. In fact, uh, uh, they are, they are, that organization had very prominent uh, upper caste members. And of course, they will not be uh, taking up the major uh, you know, positions in terms of president, secretary, or whatever they are, maybe in the duty or whatever. So they will not occupy the forefront, but it was the, the, the primary membership uh, activity uh, uh, and so on. So a lot of them were part of it. And it was a very, very important and significant uh, movement uh, from uh, uh, South India. So, uh, so similarly, uh, in, in Andhra Pradesh, also many of these, uh, uh, the left organizations have their own uh, anti-caste uh, forums, which include primarily uh, the Dalits and also uh, uh, some uh, non-Dalits who are uh, progressive who are interested and so on. Of course, the problem uh, is that uh, if you have an exclusive the Lith anti caste uh, forum i think one of the problems that we face also that when you go to the uh, village so you want to have some kind of a, a social integration program or, or you know even uh, uh, community dinner or an inter caste marriage it becomes extremely difficult for the dalit leadership to get anybody from the uh, from the other side mm -hmm. uh, so so that the, the, those are difficulties unless you have some allies from the other side, you cannot do any activity. So what we could do is, uh, is that we can oppose uh, uh, you know, atrocities. You can always pressurize the state. You can get uh, your own uh, uh, legitimate rights and so on. But, but there's no dialogue with the others in the, in the village. So that's the most difficult. Unless you also have a dialogue and you break uh, that unity of the others also, uh, then, then our, I think, program will not be uh, successful. So there's no single model and where I think this assumption is wrong that they are coming to occupy and lead or whatever. So you actually think, I would think in terms of they are uh, willing to uh, sacrifice, they are coming to uh, test themselves. So let them come and be there and then they may be tested. If they can survive in this organization, they'll survive. Otherwise they'll drop out because they have a lot to lose and they'll be excommunicated. Now in these days of Hindutva, so Hindu identity is more attractive for any upper caste person to go. So if somebody, one or two people are coming, it's good. I mean, let them come and uh, take up. Uh, thank you, Satyana. That, that was uh, really very, very um, thought-provoking and, and um, encouraging answer, positive, constructive. So that's really good. I'm very happy because sometimes you just need a little chink to go through, you know, and that's so uh, it's just the way you put it, which I think is is possible to take the step forward so i i want to uh, there's one other question which we can take uh which is can we talk about casteism within queer spaces Mina, do you want to 
Go for that. Unmute. I think that um, this is uh, something that uh, I would ask you to read the work of others who have spoken much about it, uh, especially the work of uh, Thirunangai or Grace Banu. I'm going to type their name. Um, and uh, I think for a long time there's uh, demands also for, you know, horizontal reservation, um, even for trans uh, people. So I think it's quite important that, you know, um, uh, Grace Banu, her Twitter ID is Thirunangai. Uh, so if you do look up their work, uh, there's a lot on, uh, uh, you know, casteism within queer spaces. And I also want you to refer to the work of Living Smile Vidya. Um, and she often talks about how um, even within um, the LGBTQ movement uh, uh, that, you know, a lot of these, um, uh, how, who runs this organization, who gets the funding. And she says that even within NGOs, there's a caste system, you know. So who does the ground level field work? It happens to be Dalits and who gets the funding? This happens to be Brahmins, even within queer spaces. So so this is, uh, this is something that, you know, I would advise you on both of these. I follow their work a lot and they're really passionate and they do talk about casteism in queer spaces. So I'm not the one who is... Um, the most knowledgeable on this and so i just want to send you send you over direct you to the right people to look up and read thank you thank you meena there are two questions for murli and two more for meena uh, satya do you want to say something about first the um casteism in queer spaces Oh, no, I, I think uh, I would go with uh, Mina, Mina's suggestion. So I have nothing more to add. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Balmurli, the, the two questions to you, I will read together and then to, to uh, Mina following that. So, the question is, uh, what is not to be beholden to cast me? You know, can you clarify that? That's one. And the other question is, how is it that we address the discourse of anti-caste casteism without talking about discrimination, exclusion, at first and this is just a reflection on your observation okay what is not Nina, could you just repeat the second question yeah. i didn't i didn't get it or is it is it something i can oh i, yeah. I can see it. It's there. the second question is how is it that we address the discourse of anti-caste casteism without talking about discrimination or exclusion at first okay all right um, let me just go to the so the first one was about without being beholden. Yes. I think uh, that's a fairly straightforward one that uh, at least according to how Ganeri and that quote I said about modernity, um, for example, Hindutva is beholden to the past. What I mean by that is everything in the past for them is generally speaking to be uh, revered or considered to be, uh, you know, fixed and always good. And so they make all efforts to justify everything that has happened in the past. Uh, to not be beholden to caste is to actually come out of the thrall of caste, if ever uh, uh, it was like that. And I actually think it was never because there were always anti-caste uh, sentiments, anti-caste actions, resistance to caste was always there. but. By and large, if if you think about privileged caste um, uh, being beholden to caste, at some point with modernity, even that changes, especially with the new constitution and things like that, uh, that people had to uh, come out of being beholden to that and actually name caste and caste is another problem. So I've used it in that sense. On the second one, I feel that uh, uh, the question is referring to something that I said. And so maybe I, I can re-iterate. Uh, the point is not that discrimination should not be attended to. Uh, that is not at all what I have said. What I'm saying is that casteism cannot be captured through legal lens alone. So this is a fairly uh, uncontroversial statement, I feel. And what I mean by that then is that there are some things that can come under the legal scope and they ought to be, and that is termed discrimination. But uh, if if I am saying that casteism is about monopolization of 
power and wealth and status along caste group lines, then that doesn't come under a legal lens. It is not illegal or it is not discriminatory to marry within the same caste, uh, as an example. And there are endless other things uh, uh, that are not coming under the legal lens, even uh, what Meena uh, Kandaswamy earlier talked about, Upanayanam ceremonies being uh, proliferated. It's, it's not illegal. Uh, I wish it were, but actually we need to have a different fight. And the reason for that is casteism is embedded in society. It is socially deeply entrenched. And that is the only thing that I mean about, uh, mean, uh, mean about this discrimination. We need to do that. It's a good fight. Uh, but appealing to the law, as we know, is not enough. Uh, the feminist movement has taught us that. You need the law, but it's not enough. Um, so that's all. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, you have. Thank you. I, I just want to quickly reformulate something you said to bring in another point. So you said Hindutva is beholden to the past, right? And I want to say, actually, for Hindutva, what they are beholden to is the past. They don't, there is no access to the past. They first tell you what you are, behold, what you should be beholden to. And then they tell you that is your past. So to go to, to what um, Gajendran said at the start of the lecture, we actually don't know the past. A lot of what we, what is the past, what is history, and th that's why the, uh, uh, the the fact that historiography has been dominated by certain kinds of people has left us without the resources that we need to have access to our own past right so whilst i completely agree that uh, we have to have the modernity means as uh, jonathan who i very much like says that you know uh, uh, we, we 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 should be able to step away from it and we don't we don't have to be holding to the past but we must also remember that the past is not something which is settled or given and part of what i think dalit movements are also trying to do is to find out what is the past that hidden missed obliterated lost past and that's something that we have to also uh, try to retrieve so that's just my uh, slight uh, footnote to what you've just said uh, murli um the two questions for nina and we should end in about four minutes because uh, the valedictory, the closing comment by Mahitosh will happen at eight o'clock. So the two questions to Meena, do you think that the hit back word in the slogan of VCK can also be interpreted to be beyond its physical meaning or uh, to carry a deeper meaning of anti-caste, casteist and casteism? And then the other is a very, very broad question. How will we be able to solve the problem of classism? There, there's uh, suddenly a question from Malini too, which is uh, a, an open one, I think, but I'll quickly read it. Thank you for this rich, very rich discussion. There is a long history of left Dalit anti-caste political solidarities, but there's also a well-known history of tension given the caste exclusionary and Brahminical politics of some communist leaders and parties. So my question, can you talk about the future of the left in light of the imperative of anti-casteism? So that's Malini's question, which is open to all of you. Meena, your two questions about the VCK uh, hit back slogan. Uh, you need to unmute. I'm going to take Malini's question and then go to my questions. The answer is, um, can you talk about the future of the left in light of the imperative anti-casteism? I think if the left wants to have any future at all, it has to be ex become explicitly anti-caste. So one of the shocking things that I learned very recently was that when they introduced reservation for the upper caste by calling it the economically weaker section reservation, the CPM called for this reservation to be implemented even in the private sector. The CPM has never said SCST OBC reservation should be implemented in the private sector, but when it came to protecting the rights of the upper caste, they were willing to give this call right into the private sector. They have never led, the Marxists until today have never led a movement for reservation in the private sector. 
and but they are so interested and this is so exactly where you know they might talk about class but they are basically upholding brahmanical uh, superiority they are upholding the right of you know they want reservation but this uh, where are the left on the reservation question so i do think that if the left wants to survive if they don't want us to consider them you know Man manuwadi is wearing a marxist guys and i say this some, as some as somebody who identifies herself as a communist as a marxist as a leftist i think they really have to change the game uh, we do see some you know differences coming up uh, some changes coming up like in tamil nadu they worked alongside dalit parties all the three cpi cpm and cpml worked alongside the vck to oppose hindutva to oppose the kind of you know policy neoliberal policies of the central government so it's i i'm very happy when i see solidarity but i also really think that you know uh, you are celebrating one member in your credit bureau like is that an achievement after all of these years so i do think that cpm has to look very hard at itself and criticize itself and you know i think self criticism is a marxist thing and they have to learn some of that you know um, so that's what that's where i want to answer and in terms of the question of hit back i think um, this slogan was very much a 90s early 2000s slogan i don't hear it as much now there are other slogans that you know the party puts forward and just part of four other things so in fact adanga marupo means you know we will refuse to obey which we will refuse to be quelled by you we will refuse to be oppressed by you which kind of you know is a broad thing that says you cannot regiment us you cannot put us in this box you cannot confine us within the cherry so adanga marupo held a lot of thing and the second thing was atmiruvom atmiruvom means we will transgress so you know whatever rules you keep we break them so when you talk about rules it, uh, you know saying we will break rules it means all the rules of casteism the third one was timiri elvum the fourth one was tirippi adipum so literally the last hit back is only the last part of the slogan the broader slogan held all of these anti caste uh, other meanings you know so just wanted to say the other they have they also i think this interesting work to be done in terms of you know the slogans of all you know anti caste movements whether it's periya or whether it's the vidyadala chirutagal katchi you know this something that says kadaisi manidanukkum jannayagam you know democracy to the last man so on the one hand they say annihilation of caste people's liberation and then they also say democracy to the last woman or man so you know they see themselves as a democratic struggle against caste so i just want to end it here i do <laughs> i don't think if i can talk about solving the problem of casteism so that's it i'm sorry okay yeah thank you meena um i i i'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable so if if it conks i'm very sorry i hope it doesn't um so uh satin ryan uh, would you like to answer marini's general question can you talk about the future of the left in the light of the imperative of anti casteism no, no i would only add uh, to what uh, mena uh, is saying uh, in, in the sense that uh they have made some changes some of the left parties and others they have made some changes they trying to do something separate uh, documents uh, separate organizations anti caste forums all that uh, they are doing but i think both both the left parties and the dalit parties they have to focus on uh, you know social i think reform movements more than the election politics i think election politics is an arena i think which they are not able to really do much and uh, on the other hand every day oppression atrocities are growing so they really have to think of broad social movements democratic movements to really empower people at the uh, local level uh, and so on uh, so the competing only in the exclusively in the election domain where the bjp has split all the caste groups obcs and uh, you know they identify each individual leader and give them a seat so the appropriation and hinduization of the lower caste is happening very very fast and now including the dalits that is a real danger so i don't know the left should really face uh, their attention on that uh, and even including the dalit uh, parties and organizations thank you satyanarayan uh, murli i don't think i can add anything to what my esteem colleagues have just said comrades colleagues friends yes that's it i agree okay wonderful uh, so i think that brings us to the close of the panel uh and i really really am very grateful to the three of you and to everybody who is present here uh for this wonderful discussion and um as i said before if we had free time we would carry on talking i'm sure we will find other occasions to carry on our conversations and uh now i'm going to invite mahitosh dr mahitosh mandal to deliver the valedictory 
the the last part of this two day extraordinary conference. Um, and Mahitosh, once again, thank you so much for giving us all this opportunity. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dhandra. Uh, and thank you very much, all the panelists. And I have a surprise for everybody. I will switch on the camera and you will get to see all the student volunteers and others who contributed to the conference. Here you go. Yes, yeah, so I will very quickly read out the uh, valedictory address that I have prepared. Uh, good day and good evening, everyone. We have come to uh, the end of the two-day online international conference on theorizing anti-casteism the, organized by the Department of English Presidency, University, Kolkata. It is time for me to deliver the valedictory address. At the outset, I express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Onuradha Lohia, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Presidency, University, Kolkata, for promptly giving her approval to convene the conference and supporting us till the very end. One keynote address, one panel discussion, about 100 papers and 26 parallel sessions. That's huge data and may be quite difficult to process, but we did it. We were apprehensive about Google Meet and about YouTube live streaming, but barring one or two sessions, everything went smoothly. I express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Gajendran Ayathurai for delivering an amazing keynote address that put the entire conference in motion. His conceptualization of Brahminical sciolism and critical caste studies opened up new ways to critique Brahminism and theorize anti-casteism at the very outset. I'm humbled by the fact that he dedicated the talk to me. The panelists of the conference, Professor Kesuttanaran, Dr. Meena Kandasam, Professor Meena Randa, and Professor Varmulli Natarajan are established international names with extremely busy schedule. I'm grateful to each of them for having responded to my request to be a part of the conference and for sharing their remarkable insights on anti-casteism. Their conversations have been enriching and have implications that I believe are far reaching and have been the most appropriate conclusion to the conference. Although I'm yet to receive formal feedback, from what I have witnessed in these two days, I would say the conference has been a grand success. I had about 15 devices opened in front of me, and I was in a unique position whereby I could listen to parts of every single parallel session. From what I have gathered, most of the presentations have been critically informed, visually captivating, theoretically innovative, and I would even say politically far reaching. I congratulate all the presenters who joined from various parts of the world, including United Kingdom, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and almost all the states of India. They promptly responded to our call for papers, submitted their full papers in a very short period of time, and made it to the conference on both the days. The interactions and reflections their papers generated have profusely contributed to defining and reformulating the what and how of casteism and anti-casteism. Audiences joined from within presidency and from around the country and the world, both on Google Meet and on YouTube. Without them, without the audience, most of the interactions would not have happened. I sincerely thank them. My colleagues at the Department of English Presidents University have continuously helped me at various stages of the conference. They recommended my proposal for the conference, helped in processing the large amount of submission, double-checked the drafts, gave their valuable suggestions, and chaired sessions. My heartfelt thanks to Professor Shanta Dotto, Professor Shumit Chakraborty, Dr. Purna Banerjee, Dr. Onupama Mohan, Dr. Muhammad Monul Islam, Dr. Kollan Kumar Das, Dr. Mongshumi Mondol, Priyanka Das, Devanjana Naik, and Onir Bandre. Apart from my colleagues, many scholars from outside the Department of English, as well as from outside Presidency University, readily agreed to chair the sessions on my request. I bombarded them with emails, and they patiently and enthusiastically responded to me. Despite huge differences in time zones, all of them joined every single session before time. I remain deeply indebted to Anandita Pan, Antura Roy, Antura Ray, Orijit Mondol, Orun Prabha Mukherjee, Asha Singh, 
Dickens Leonard, Laura Patania, Ishita Roy, Joel Lee, Kartik Ram Monaharan, Modhura Damle, Meruna Murmu, Minar Handa, Nondini Shaha, Rajot Roy, and Rup Kumar Borman. Special thanks to Professor Minar Handa who, in spite of her busy schedule, gave her valuable feedback on the concept note and helped me with the program schedule and suggested the names of the potential chairs. This conference could literally not have been possible without the hard work of our student volunteers. A core team of 14 students worked day and night to pull up this conference. They developed the amazing website, created posters, double checked the draft of the program schedule several times, sent out emails to the registered participants, created Google Meet invites, hosted the day long meetings, introduced the chairs, live streamed all the sessions on YouTube, and last but not the least, attended late evening meetings. And in spite of that, woke up very early in the morning to work for the conference. Without them, I could not have imagined organizing 26 parallel sessions in just two days. So a big shout out for each one of them. Oishani, Oritro, Orna, Borishon, Hironno, Meghomala, Ritika, Shagor, Shurosri, Shopnil, Probal and Dhritima who are not here. A big thank you to our Department of Secretary Ms. Devarudhi Shen for hosting two very crucial sessions and Mr. Shahodev Hajra who arranged food and drink for us and ensured that we are safely secluded from the outside world so as to conduct the sessions smoothly. Uh, our senior system analyst, Mr. Devapurthi Misro and his team of technical experts ensured beforehand that the systems were ready for live streaming the sessions. Our class representatives collated emails of the departmental chairs of various institutions across the country and helped me send the conference call for papers to, to them. I thank them all. As we bring the two-day online international conference on theorizing and precastism to a close, on behalf of the Department of English Presidency University, Kolkata, I once again sincerely thank you all for your remarkable and shall I say historic contribution to this grand event. Good day and good night to all of you. Thank you very much.